Hopefully the recording will work today. Yeah, okay, anyway. Kip, David, Hodges, Sippel, Eric, Midkiff, yep. Butler, Polly, Rice is online. Cedric Richardson's online. Massey's here. Newton, Burdett, Hudson, Felder, Tudor. Gotcha. Asbury, Bowers, Hemmings, Redmond, Reed. Kayla, Kinsey, right, Kinsey, and Van Cross. So we've got Reed online. Burdett is online. Kip is online. Hodges is online. Felder is online. Cedric is online. Hmm. Typical Monday. I would. I'd be online too if, if I could. I'm exhausted, and I forgot my coffee at home. Oh yeah, today's a rough one. Yeah, it is. It's horrible. Oh, I thought about it. <laughs> I might go in between my office hours and um, lab if I can make it that long. Let's see, Michaela's online. So we got Van Cross, Redmond. Yep. Everybody else is accounted for. Well, we've got less than two minutes, so and since we're recording, I'll do announcements and reminders. Um, let's see. Let's, for the lab, this lab is so important and also so complicated that I've broken it up into two weeks. So this week is nothing but a pre-lab lecture. And then next week, we'll actually do the experiment. So if you watch that video and answer the questions and get 100% of them correct, you do not need to come to lab today. For this week because it's the same thing the same thing that's in the video is what i'm going to tell you i might say it a little bit differently so if you like i said if you do that and get 100 percent, you don't need to come to lab today um I, and i'm happy to see a lot of you've already done it so anyway when i get around to grading it i'll let you know what grade you got and if you didn't get 100 percent, if we can find a time to meet and i can talk to you about the questions you missed then you still don't have to come to lab because that's to me might as well be 100 percent attendance the day doesn't matter right so if you're in the monday section just fill i'm gonna come in on wednesday this is the one time you can do that you don't need to let me know um because i don't need any materials right it's a pre-lab lecture so it doesn't matter which day you come in so any questions about lab all right um and speaking of like i said i've seen uh, i glanced at my emails and saw that a lot of people have done it I'm really happy about that that's awesome uh, and on the same note i've seen a lot of people turn in some independent work so I've got a lot of grading to do, a lot of catching up to do. I'm very happy. So if you've turned something in, especially if it's your first time turning something in, and you're like, why hasn't he gotten back to me? Did he get it? Don't worry about it. I'm working on it. Um, All right, attendance, that was a mistake. Like. Uh, there was a glitch between my reporting and what financial aid got. So you guys all got that email or a lot of you got that email saying you need to do something for proof of attendance, but I've taken care of it. It's officially taken care of. There's nothing you need to worry about. Um, there's like one person in this class. You've never seen them because they've never been here who actually needs a proof of attendance because, well, what matter? Cause they've never been here. So 
even if they tried to do a proof of attendance uh, sheet, they would not get it. So none of you have to worry about proof of attendance, at least for this class. Any questions about that? All right. Um, what else? What other announcements? It's 801. I guess we can get started. Let me think. It's Monday. And like I said, I haven't had my coffee, so I'm a little slow to start. All right. Well, we should be recording this time. I thought we were recording on Friday. It just didn't work. Hopefully this time it, it does work. Let's jump into chapter six. Um, before we do that, I want to remind you of what I said about chapter five. Actually, let me remind you of what I said about this entire exam two, right? So the next ex exam, exam two, is going to be chapters five, six, and seven. And of all the properties of life, if you had to boil down this whole entire lab or uh, exam, you could say it is about the transformations of energy, right? The fact that we need energy to survive, that's what this whole exam is about. So chapter five, like I said, if you don't remember anything else from chapter five, you just, there's quite a bit that you need to remember. But the number one thing you need to remember from chapter five is cells need ATP for energy, right? That is how we live. Uh, oh, well, I'll keep it like that. We live because our cells need and get ATP. So this next chapter answers the question, well, if our cells need ATP. Where does that come from? And that's what this chapter is. Cellular respiration is uh, that your, your textbook calls it obtaining energy from food. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to And I admit this is a little bit boring, especially if you're not into it like I am. But again, it's really, really important because without this process, we just wouldn't be alive. So let's jump into it. Can anybody tell me what this is a picture of? Who you can guess? Yeah, it's a brain. Um, and your book gets specific, and I don't remember the numbers. You could look it up for independent work if you want. Um, actually, it's in your book. But anyway, your book gets pretty in a certain amount of time or how much ATP you use just by your brain, right? Forget the fact that you have muscles that are moving and working and you need energy for that. Remember we learned that one muscle cell uses, what was it, 10,000 ATP a second, right? Um, this one talks about your brain. You can look it up if you want. But the point is you need energy, right? And not just for athletic things and moving around and stuff like that. It requires ATP. Uh, how about this? Can you tell what this is a picture of? Yeah, it's a sports car. It's not a first time your textbook has used a picture of a car, and it's in the same context as the other times it's shown a car. So does anyone remember functions, specifically cellular respiration? What in the world would a car have anything in common with cellular respiration? Does anybody remember? I like that. That would be great. Um, and yes, I mean, that's not what your book is getting at. But yeah, you could have a whole argument about that. Matter of fact, that would be an interesting independent work topic. Pick any non-living thing and then use the properties of life to talk about. It. Like, well, it has this property of life and this one and this one and this one. Um, but it's not living. But also springboarding off of what you said, yes. If we're talking about the properties of life, because that's not living, but it does have some of the properties of life. It does one thing that we do. And yet again, your book has a, had a picture of this in the last chapter, maybe even chapter three as well. Anybody remember? How about this? Can, what's that part of the car? Does anybody know? Yeah, that's the air intake. Say the respiration is us breathing. Well, respiration is us breathing in air. But anyway, cars take in oxygen and then they burn their fuel, right? The octane. Remember that picture of the octane that I showed you for biological? release the energy that's stored in the bonds of those of those molecules. And that energy is then used to move the car. And that's basically what cellular respiration is. It's also burning fuel in the presence of oxygen to release the energy um, that's held in those molecules. And then that energy is then put to use, not to make us move forward all the time like the car does, but to do other things like make ATP for your brain and everything else. Do I know what that's a picture of? Soy sauce, yes. <laughs> Any idea? what that might have to do with cellular respiration. That's a tough, that's, that one's a little bit tougher. That would make sense. There is salt in it. Um, I bet actually, um, as far as our conversations are concerned, we don't even talk about salt in this process. But I'll just go ahead and tell you, does anybody know how soy sauce is made in general? Obviously it's made from soybeans, but the process, does anybody know what it's called? 
All right, what if that was a big glass of beer? Because you might know how beer is made. Like, what's that process called? Or wine or liquor? Fermentation, yes. So that'll be the first word for attendance. It's fermentation. Don't feel bad if you spell it wrong. Or online, send me the you know send me the word before nine a.m. The first word is fermentation. But anyway, fermentation is a different type of respiration. It's not technically respiration, but it, it is similar in that it breaks down molecules for the purpose of releasing energy to make ATP. And we're going to learn. Anyway, oh yeah, and if you're if you're watching the video, I haven't decided if I'm going to make questions for the video. Uh, but if I don't make questions for the video, then send me a picture of something fermented. So a beer, wine, liquor, soy sauce, anything else that's fermented. There's other stuff that's fermented, other foods that have been fermented. So you can look that up if you want. Or for extra credit, you could buy me a beer. I'm just kidding. I'd be in so much trouble. Uh, all right, as a reminder, every chapter starts off with this biology and society where they have a little story of try to tell you why this chapter is relevant to your everyday life and I recommend reading it it's good to help you understand why it's relevant but I already basically told you why it's relevant because without the cellular respiration we would be dead so that's why it's relevant but you can read all about that especially if you are into fitness or you're a student athlete this introduction might be very interested in uh, interesting to you plus it's a good thing to start off right you can read this and then if your brain comes up with any questions like hmm, I wonder about this that has to do with athletes or sports. And you can look that up for independent work. Anyway, yeah, read all about it if you want. Here we go. This chapter is broken on the three main bullet points. First thing we're going to talk about is like this big over, overarching picture. We're going to talk about what the whole thing's about, which is the energy flow and chemical cycling. So in a way, that first bullet point is going to basically explain all three chapters. We're going to learn, we're going to go back and talk a little bit about what you learned in chapter five. We're going to discuss what we're going to learn in chapter six, and you're going to discuss what we're going to learn in chapter seven. Because like I said, this whole exam is about how we have to convert energy from one form to another. Specifically, and I'll put it in this way because this is a good chronological, chronological way to think about it. Chapter seven says there's sunlight energy, and when you use that sunlight energy to make glucose, that's what chapter seven is. Chapter six, which we're about to start, says, here's some glucose. This is what we break down to make ATP. And then chapter five is, here's some ATP. That's what our cells need to, uh, to make energy, right? So let's jump into it. Energy flow and chemical cycling. As you already know, I keep saying this, all life requires energy. That is one of those eight properties of life you learned earlier. And here's something you should know. This will probably be a test question. It's definitely a question on the study guide. Where does that energy ultimately originate from? It originates with the sun. I put a little star next to that because there are some very few exceptions where there are some ecosystems where the energy does not come um, solely from the sun. You could look that up for independent work if you want, which would be exceptions. You don't need to know them, obviously, but you can look them up for independent work. Even really dark places, like the bottom of really deep oceans where the sun doesn't penetrate, the energy still originates with the sun. Because what do you think happens when whales die and fish die and all that? It just rains. They, they just, their carcasses sink. Sometimes they float, but usually they sink and they disintegrate on their way down. And it just basically snows dead debris at the bottom of the ocean in some spots. But that dead debris, those are, you know, those are molecules that hold energy in those bonds that originated with the sun. So yeah, I know that. Second, since the, since the energy originates with the sun, let's talk about photosynthesis. And you don't necessarily need to write this down yet because we're gonna have a whole chapter on it. That's gonna be the next chapter. But photosynthesis can energy, specifically the chemical energy of sugars and other molecules. Yeah, I'll definitely put an X to this. So again, if you're taking notes, I wouldn't take notes yet. Just know, you already know what photosynthesis is anyway. And when I give you, when we really start talking about better photosynthesis, there's actually a better definition than that anyway. So I'm going to put an X to that. But yeah, you know what photosynthesis is, right? So again, all energy 
as far as we're concerned, originates from the sun on Earth. Um, so it's photosynthesis. That's the process. It's harvesting that energy and changing it to forms that the rest of us can use. And that's what that bullet point is right there, right? Animals depend on this for food and more. Of course, not just animals. Fungi, protists, everything. Without photosynthesis, we wouldn't have life on Earth. Anyway, any questions about this slide? It's a great introduction as far as the exam is concerned. There's not much on there that's important. Maybe that first bullet point that, um, or the second one, that all energy originates with the sun. All right. Producers and consumers. This is going to be at you twice. So we're going to talk about it now in the concept, uh, in the context of energy, energy flow from the sun to us, basically. But then later, much later in the, in the uh, semester, when we're almost done, we're going to talk about this stuff again. So this is the first time you're going to learn about it. You learn about it again. I might or might not test you on it the first time. Um, if I don't trust you the first time, I'll definitely test you on that next exam when we come back to it. But the first thing you need to know is what an autotroph is. An autotroph is a plant and basically any other, as far as we're concerned, any other photosynthetic thing. Something that makes its own food. Or as your book puts it, they make their own organic matter, the ones we learned about in Chapter 3, which are carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, from inorganic nutrients. Among other things, the big stuff that they use is the carbon dioxide from the air, usually, right? If it's an aquatic plant, it's getting it, the carbon dioxide that's been um, mixed, with, um, mixed with the water. Then obviously there's the water itself, and of course, minerals from the soil. water but you're gonna learn about that later because you already knew that anyway I'm sure you knew plants need carbon dioxide and water but when we get to it chapter seven we're gonna get really specific you need you're gonna know exactly in what process they use the water and carbon dioxide but anyway those are autotrophs there's also again we only talk about photosynthetic autotrophs or phototrophs is what they're really called because that's all that matters in bio 101 but there are other things if you want to look them up for independent work. What are some other autotrophs? Things that are not photosynthetic. So things that make their own organic matter, right? They, they make their own food, but they don't use energy from the sun. So what are they and where do they get their energy? Kind of goes back to that other question I already asked you for independent work. Not all ecosystems depend on the sun. So what are the exceptions? Anyway, those are autotrophs. The opposite, if you want to call it that, are that's us, amongst other things, that are heterotrophs. Those are things that eat other stuff, right? They can't make their own food, so they have to eat things that have made their own food. Like humans, we eat plants. Right? Organic matter. Sometimes we also eat other animals that ate plants. And the reason is, is because we, humans, and any other heterotroph, cannot make our own organic molecules. So a lot of those carbs, lipid, proteins, and nucleic acids, a lot of them, not all of them, we can't make. So we have to get it from other, need another thing. Any questions about the difference between autotrophs and heterotrophs? Here's an interesting, I think, an interesting um, independent work topic if you want. So a lot of people think of autotrophs as plants, and that is true. Plants are autotrophs. But first of all, there are some exceptions. There are some plants that, you know, due to some mutations, cannot produce, their, they can't do photosynthesis. So they actually have to get their... Um, which plants do that? Which plants don't do photosynthesis? And then the other thing you can look up, if you want to, for independent work, is when we talk about autotrophs, it's, again, proto-autotrophs, the ones that do photosynthesis, most people think of plants when they think of photosynthesis. And that's good, because usually that's what we talk about. But there are other photosynthetic organisms, so you can look that up, too, for independent work, if you want. Let's see, the next independent work, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to point to it on the screen. So if you're laying in your bed... 
with your eyes closed because it's a Monday and you also forgot your coffee, open them up for a second and look at the next word for attendance. And if you're in person and want to get extra credit, again, send it before 9 a.m. If you're online and doing it for attendance, send the word before 9 a.m. And if you're watching the video, if I don't post questions with the video, send a picture of soil instead of the word soil. All right. So any questions about this slide? This is all the easy stuff. Again, we're still in the first main bullet point. It doesn't, it doesn't start getting harder and more boring until the next main bullet point. All right, like I've already said, most ecosystems depend entirely on photosynthesis for food, which brings us to another term, or two more terms. In the context of uh, this conversation, then called producers. And heterotrophs are called consumers. And I'm going to put it next to this because I'm definitely not going to ask you this until later in the semester because you're going to learn about this again producers or consumers will come up again and it'll be more important then. in this context i think it's more important that you understand the difference between a heterotroph and an autotroph because that's really specifically talking about you know are you making your own organic matter or are you using the sun's energy or are you eating something that does but yeah just so you know autotrophs are producers heterotrophs are consumers like this this animal that's a koala that's a heterotroph. And if you're interested, I think koala bears are really, really interesting for independent work because, I mean, I think they're a little bit cute, but they're also really interesting animals because they're some of the dumbest animals on earth. Really, really stupid. And you can look up why. Part of it has to do with their brain. Part of it has to do with the fact that they're high a lot. Um, like something like 80 something percent of them have an STD. I think it's chlamydia. They're just really, really stupid. Anyway, it's, it's worth looking into. For independent work if you want they sleep like 20 something hours a day i think i don't know i'm not a i'm not a koala koalogist but they are interesting anyway any questions about what's on this slide oh yeah another thing they only eat eucalyptus leaves and they only eat it if it's growing on a tree or if they think it is like if you go to a zoo you'll never see them eating out of anything other than eucalyptus leaves and it's not like they put them in a bowl like, hey, here's some eucalyptus leaves. They're too stupid for that. They won't recognize them as eucalyptus leaves. They have to look like they're growing on a tree. Ah, they're so dumb and so cute. Anyway, let's look at the second bullet point of this first main bullet point, which again, this is big picture stuff. We're going to talk about chemical cycling between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. If you're taking notes, if you're a note taker, you could probably give your hand a rest for this. Because really, this is an overview of stuff we're going to cover in chapter six and seven. So, and I'll let you know which is which. But a lot of this is just like scratching the surface, and we're about to dive deep. So here, let's scratch the surface before we dive deep. Yeah, like this, for example. No need to write this down. We're going to talk about it in much detail later. The ingredients for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water. So even though you don't, even though I'm telling you, you don't necessarily need to write that down yet. You can if you want, but you definitely need to know that. If anything, and this is how I recommend yeah. first. Well, first of all, memorize the big thing for photosynthesis, which is that we're taking sun energy and making glucose with it, right? We're converting sun energy to the chemical energy of glucose. Then once you have that memorized, get a little bit more specific and say, okay, we're doing that by using carbon dioxide and water, right? So those are our ingredients. We're using sun energy. We're using those ingredients. Memorize that first, and then start worrying about those details that I'm going to fill in later. But then you get your book gets a little bit specific and tells you stuff you probably already know. Where does the CO2 come from? It comes from the air. Specifically, there's these little tiny holes in the leaves called stomata. That's where the CO2 comes from. I'm not going to get that into detail, so I'm going to put an X to that. Even when we talk about photosynthesis in detail, I'm not going to ask you, like, which part of the plant does it come from? Because this is, a, you're not learning about plants here. You're learning about photosynthesis, the process. Also, water, right? You need water, and you're going to learn why and exactly how it uses water. And I'm sure you already knew, but it gets it from the roots. So I'm going to put an X to that because I'm not going to ask you about the physiology of plants. Just know, and again, we're going to cover the detail later, 
the, the ingredients for photosynthesis, the things that are used in photosynthesis, are carbon dioxide and water. And I will say this, because I don't know if your book, I don't remember if your book emphasizes this enough or not. I think it's really interesting. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I knew that the roots were bringing stuff in from the soil, right? Especially water. I knew that. And I just assumed most of a plant, like if you're looking at a tree, most of that physical stuff that you're looking at that you can feel i just assumed most of that came originally from the roots but just so you know not this will be a tough question or anything but almost everything that you're looking at on the tree you know the big ass heavy trees part of my french that almost entirely came from the air so all the mass that is a tree came from carbon dioxide mostly right that's where it's getting its weight so it really is made up from you know was that made from thin air yes mostly a plant was made from thin air which to me is interesting and you'll learn later the water itself, physical weight of water, is not really incorporated much into the, into the plant. And we'll learn about that in Chapter 7. So anyway, any questions about this slide? All right. You don't no need to write this down either because, again, this is just an introduction. This is a big picture. We're going to talk about this in detail in Chapter 7. But there's these things called chloroplasts inside plant cells. And they use the light energy to rearrange atoms of those ingredients so they rearrange the atoms of the uh, carbon dioxide and water to produce sugars and other so it's the chloroplasts that are doing this the chloroplast is using that light energy to rearrange all that stuff that they're using to produce glucose I'm going to underline that because like it says right there. It's going to focus on glucose. So as far as we're concerned in conversations and as far as we're concerned on exams, photosynthesis produces glucose. You can just remember that. And yes. For, for your own knowledge, in the back of your mind, remember, yes, technically it produces other stuff, but we're focused on glucose. That is our focus. And, of course, as a byproduct, it releases gas, right? That's where the oxygen that we breathe comes from, from photosynthesis. Hopefully you recognize that crossbow because I've used it in Chapter 5, and I think I even used it in Chapter 3 to remind you. Remember I said all the energy that you used to pull that crossbow back, that energy... It's going to be released when you pull the trigger, right? So how, however hard it was to pull it back, however much energy you had to put into it, that's how much energy will be released. Same here. When we use this glucose, or excuse me, when we make the glucose, when we use the light energy to make that glucose, however much energy was put into making that is ready to be released when you burn. Excuse me, this chapter, that's the most important concept there is. The glucose is a high energy molecule took a lot of energy to build it. Therefore, when we break it down, which is all of what chapter six is about, it's going to release a lot of energy. So any questions about this slide? Um, let's see. I guess that could be the next attendance word, crossbow, since it's right there. So again, if you're in person and want extra credit, you can send me a picture. I mean, send me the word crossbow before 9 a.m. If you're online, then you need to send me the word crossbow along with the other ones before 9 a.m. to get attendance. And if you're watching questions with this video, then send me a picture of a crossbow. All right, moving forward. This is still just the overview. There's a crossbow again. So as you probably already know, actually, here's the part you probably already knew and probably think of when you think of it, uh, animals use the products of photosynthesis as a source of energy, right? So we eat plants to get energy. Cows eat plants to get energy, and then we eat cows, some of us, right? We all knew that. That part's not due. So I think one thing that thing people uh, people forget often is that plants also use the same product. So plants are interesting, right? So let me throw it back to what I said from Chapter 5, because you need to know this, so it's a good time to remind you. Your cells need ATP for energy, right? That's where they get their energy without... ATP, your cells die. And it's the same as plants. So even though plants are photosynthetic organisms that get this energy from the sun, they still, their cells themselves, don't get their energy for their work from the sun. 
they only use the sun energy to produce glucose and then they have to do the same thing we do which is break down that glucose to make atp so even for plants they need atp to survive and they need the products of photosynthesis like glucose to survive because they don't directly use the energy from the sun for their everyday living so to speak they use it to make the glucose which then they break down to make atp just like us and that process is called cellular respiration which your book is defining at least right now as the harvest of energy stored in sugars and i'm going to put it next to this <laughs> because i'm almost definitely not going to ask you the definition of cellular respiration which is a good time to tell you what this exam is mostly going to be like for this section even though i haven't told you yet you're about to learn it cellular respiration is broken down into three stages so almost entirely this chapter the questions are going to be in which stage does this happen and which stage is that produced and which stage is this used right so you use things you produce things that's mostly what the exam is going to be about for this chapter so as i'm teaching it as i'm teaching you those three stages i'm going to keep bringing that up and i just want you to remember that as we move forward because that's how the test is going to go Anyway, I put a little star next to the word sugars. That's verbatim from your book. But again, like I said earlier, cellular respiration, or excuse me, photosynthesis does more than make sugars. It makes other stuff too. We just don't talk about it. Same here. Cellular respiration, it breaks down stuff other than sugars. But to keep things simple, we only focus on the sugars, specifically glucose. So any questions about this slide? Um... No need to write this down either. But respiration uses oxygen. You need to know that. The only reason I'm saying there's no need to write it down is because you're going to learn it later. Not only are you going to need to know that it uses oxygen, you're going to need to know what happens after that oxygen is used. Once the oxygen is used, it turns into something else. And you're going to need to know all that. So for now, I'll just remind you that respiration uses oxygen. And it's easy to remember because even though we're talking about cellular respiration, you just think of regular old respiration, like breathing. When you breathe in, the purpose of breathing in is to get oxygen, right? I mean, you're not getting much of it, but that's the purpose of it, is to get oxygen. So that should help you remember respiration uses oxygen. And using oxygen, it converts the energy and the chemical bonds of the organic fuels, such as glucose, which is the one that we're going to focus on, to make ATP. So, this is how I would recommend studying cellular respiration, the same way I recommend studying photosynthesis. Start with the big picture and then start adding in details. And this is the first big picture thing. Cellular respiration uses oxygen to convert the energy and chemical bonds to make ATP. Or let's put it this way. The better way of thinking of it at first is cellular respiration makes ATP. Remember that first. Then once you have that memorized, then you can say something like cellular respiration breaks down glucose in the presence of oxygen to make ATP. And then once you have that memorized, then you can start memorizing some of these other details I'm going to give you moving forward. As you already know from Chapter 5, that ATP is what cells use for work. Right? You learned that in Chapter 5. And again, like I said, if there's anything... Do you remember from chapter five? It's that bullet point right there. Cells need ATP to live, basically. Right? You get everything else, which I hope you don't. Remember that thing. And then your book gets a little bit specific. So this is new for you, at least for this class. You may look, but the production of the ATP occurs in organelles called the mitochondria. So that's where I put a star next to this because that's where most of it happens. There are exceptions. You're going to learn about some of those exceptions. But for the sake of studying, for the sake of the exam, in a sense, you should think ATP and um, mitochondria. ATP are made in mitochondria. For independent work, you can look up the exceptions. Right? It's not just ATP. There's other ones I don't teach you about. You can look that up if you want. Um, and again, it doesn't all happen in mitochondria. You can look that up if you want to. I'll give you one of the exceptions later in this chapter. So any questions about this slide? This is a picture of mitochondria, by the way. And we'll talk more about that later.
cellular respiration needs, right? It uses oxygen. It uses glucose. Those are the ingredients, so to speak, because it breaks down glucose in the presence of oxygen. What are the waste products? And this is another thing you should know, but necessi not, you don't necessarily need to write it down yet because, again, we're going to talk about it later. But the waste products are carbon dioxide and water. What your book points out, those are the same ingredients used for photosynthesis. So in so many ways, photosynthesis and respiration are just a big cycle, right? Respiration produces stuff that photosynthesis uses. And then the byproducts of photosynthesis are what respiration uses, right? And the circle continues. It's just a big cycle. So you do need to know this equation right here. So again, if you're adding to that sentence, remember, like I said, study this and then start adding details. So we could add to the details. Respiration breaks down glucose in the presence of oxygen to make ATP. That's what I already said. Now we can get a little bit more specific. Respiration breaks down glucose in the presence of oxygen to make ATP, but in the process also makes carbon dioxide and water. So see, I'm adding a little bit more detail. And then later, like I said, it's going to get real specific. Because I'm going to say, in which of the three stages do we use glucose? Which of the three stages do we use oxygen? Um, in which of the three stages do we produce carbon dioxide? In which of the three stages do we produce water? In which of the three stages do we produce ATP? So we'll get into more detail. But again, this is big picture stuff. Does anybody have any questions about the differently but my recommendation is study it that way study the big picture before you start adding in details one yet at least not in this class that's what it looks like you got that sunlight energy and that chloroplast uses that energy to rearrange the carbon dioxide and water to make glucose and the, and the process of doing that, it also makes a byproduct of oxygen. So these things the photosynthesis produces are used for uh, respiration, right? Because respiration breaks down glucose in the presence of oxygen to make ATP. And in the process, makes the byproducts of carbon dioxide and water. Big picture stuff. So again, The chapter that's all chapter six and seven wrapped up into one um into one picture let's see yeah that's it now there was also another picture showing um this atp i got a little arrow pointing to a to a, a cell and saying something about that five six and seven in one picture but as it is right now that's chapter six and seven all right your book is, this is still a big overview. Plants make more than they need for fuel, right? So like I said, plants, they make glucose because they need it too, right? They also have to go through cellular respiration. They also have to break down. They don't use the sun energy to live. They use the sun energy to make glucose, which then they break down like we do to make ATP to live. But they make extra. What's that extra used for? Well, you've got plant growth, which is where cellulose comes in, and you learn that in chapter three. Right? Chapter three is a poly, or cellulose is a polysaccharide that basically makes up the cell wall. I know you might think of them as green, and that is the predominant color, and that is chlorophyll, but most of the stuff is cellulose. And of course, again, as you know from chapter three, the other surplus can be stored as starch. So there's nothing new there. As a matter of fact, I'll even put an X to this because I've already asked you about that. But anyway, I've already asked you that on um, exam one, so I probably won't ask it again on this next exam. And of course, your book gets really, uh, really obvious and say, people take advantage of this by eating plants. Yes, so I'm sure you already knew that. I'll also put an X to that. I'm sure you already knew that. Anyway, any questions about this slide? As far as the exam is, is concerned, this is not an important slide at all. I'm just teaching from the book the way your book presents it.
Yes. So we're done with the first main bullet point. That's good. That means we can at least get the a good introduction into the second bullet point. Maybe even start diving into the second bullet point before the, the day's over. But this next bullet point is cellular respiration, the aerobic harvest of food energy. So basically, this is the meat and potatoes as far as the exam is concerned. This second bullet point, this is where it's at. The first bullet point, energy flow and chemical cycling, that's just a big overview of everything you're about to learn for chapters 6 and 7. As far as the exam is concerned. And then again, like I said, we talked about fermentation, right? Beer. Uh, wine, liquor, soy sauce, that kind of stuff. So you're going to learn briefly about fermentation. There will be a couple of questions about it. But again, a majority of your, your exam for Chapter 6 is going to be this bullet point here. So let's talk about it. Cellular respiration, as you already know, is the harvesting of chemical energy from organic fuel molecules. I'm not going to ask you that because, again, I'm not going to ask you the definition of cellular respiration. I'm going to say in which stage does this happen, which stage uses this, which stage produces that. So... I know from chapter five, and again, you need to know it. It's the main way that the chemical energy gets harvested from food and is converted to make ATP. So again, there are other ways to make ATP, but this is the main way, at least for us. As you already know from the introduction, it requires oxygen, which means it's aerobic. That's and this is sort of new. I've already said this, but now.
Interesting. So it kicked us out, and then it's still recording. That's odd. So it kicked us out, and now we're back in, and it kept recording. I don't know what it kept recording. Anyway, we'll see how that works out. Um, Sideshow from current side. So obviously, if you're in person or online, hopefully that won't matter. But if you're watching a video, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, say the respiration. You don't need to. But for your own knowledge, it consists of about, whoops, 24 separate chemical reactions. You're not going to learn all 24. So again, that's something you can keep in the back of your mind, too. 24 chemical reactions, and you're not going to learn about most of them. There's a specific enzyme for each of those over 24 reactions. Again, I'm not going to ask about that either. Just something to keep in mind. That'll be slightly important to think about for lab, right? So there's one lab, one experiment you're going to do in lab where you're looking at temperature, like right? does temperature affect the rate of photosynthesis? Does temperature affect the rate of respiration? And now you know that there's an enzyme for each single step. And as you already know from chapter three, as you need to know, actually chapter three and chapter five, um, enzymes are proteins, and it's all about their shape, right? The effects of shape is temperature. So keep that in the back of your mind for a lab, but as far as the exam is concerned, you can brain dump it. Um, say the respiration is also one of the most important meta metabolic pathways for newly every eukaryotic cell. I'm not going to test you on that. This is just another reason of saying, or another way of saying, hey, this is important, this is why you're learning about it. You might not recognize this word because we skipped chapter four. We are eukaryotes, right? There's two basic types of cells. There's eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are the bigger, more complex cells like plants and animals or fungi. Um, prokaryotic cells are the more basic ones like bacteria. So as far as we are concerned, eukaryotes, this is very important to us. So again, your book is just saying, this is why you're learning it. Before I snooze you to death, just know that it's important. Um, and as you should know already, cellular respiration provides the energy that cells need to maintain life. Specifically, it provides the ATP, um, and that's the energy that the cells need to maintain life. So any questions about this slide? All right, here's something you need to know, and I guess you could write it down now if you want, or you can wait until we dig deep into them. But the three main stages in order are glycolysis, then citric acid cycle, then electric transport excuse me, electron transport. So you're going to need to know those, you need to know them in those order, in that order, because they do happen chronologically mostly, but as far as the way I teach it, they do happen chronologically. And again, this is what most of the exam is going to be. Which stage uses this? Which stage produces that? Which stage happens inside of the mitochondria? Which stage happens outside of the mitochondria? These kind of questions. So most of you, most of this multiple exam, multiple choice exam for this part, your choices are going to be glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport, some combination of these. Yeah, that's that's the that's going to be your choices. So A, B, C, or like A and B or B and C. You'll see. Anyway, any questions so far? I will point out. You might want to take notes on this too. If you're the kind of person who likes to really look stuff up and like you're trying to learn it here, but then you look at videos online just so you can learn it in different ways, which I recommend, then you should know that citric acid cycle is also called the Krebs cycle. I'm not going to test you on that, but obviously if you're looking up and you want to learn, like I want to see what this video says about uh, say the respiration and they keep saying Krebs cycle. I'm like, what the hell is the Krebs cycle? Why won't they talk about the citric acid cycle? Well, there you go. That's why. And there's a reason I call it the citric acid cycle instead of the Krebs cycle. And I'll tell you when we're there. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this video. All right. Uh, download that video and watch a little uh, animation about it. All right, here we go. And this is still the overview. We're getting into a little bit more detail, but this is still just the overview. The first step is glycolysis. As you should know, right? Memorize that. Oh, yeah. Let me also go back, right? So, like I said, memorize the big picture before you memorize the details. So, that last slide was a little bit more detail, right? So, photosynthesis, excuse me, respiration breaks down glucose in the presence of oxygen to make ATP. 
and in the process makes carbon dioxide and water, right? You have that memorized. Then you can say that same thing, photosynthesis, excuse me, respiration, breaks down glucose and the presence of oxygen to make ATP, and in the process produces carbon dioxide and water, and it does it in three steps, glycolysis, um, citric acid cycle, and electron transport. Then once you have that memorized, all right, what is glycolysis? Glycolysis is when we split glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. And this usually happens in the cytoplasm, which I haven't said much, but if we did chapter four, you would know basically we're just saying in the cell as opposed to in the mitochondria, right? Because I already told you earlier that most of this happens in the mitochondria, and it does. But specifically, um, this one stage does not happen in the mitochondria. This happens outside of the mitochondria. This happens in the cell. So for the exam, what you need to know about the gly glycolysis so far is that glucose, we start with glucose and we break it down to make pyruvate. You don't even necessarily need to know that we start with one molecule of glucose and then get two molecules of pyruvate. Just know that we start with glucose and end with pyruvate. So the test questions on this slide are, which of the three stages uses glucose? The answer is glycolysis. Which of the three stages produces pyruvate? And the answer is glycolysis. Which of the three stages happens in the cytoplasm or outside of the mitochondria? And the answer is glycolysis. So there's three test questions right there in that one little sentence. Citric acid cycle, that's the next one, right? This is one of the two that happens in the mitochondria. So there's another test question. Which of the three stages happens inside the mitochondria? Citric acid cycle. And also the electron transport chain, but we'll get there. So we know we started with glucose, right? And we ended up with pyruvate. And you can learn about this in more detail later. But then the pyruvate goes into the citric acid cycle where it completes the breakdown of that molecule to release waste products. As far as I'm concerned, this is a useless bullet point for now because we're going to talk about it in more detail. So right now it's too vague to be important. Glycolysis and the citric acid cycle generate a small amount of ATP directly and much more indirectly by transferring electrons. And you know what? We'll just leave it at that. So let's just say we finished glycolysis and citric acid cycle. Um, and the last word for attendance will be, I don't know, let's think of something. Just waste. There we go. Waste is the last word for attendance. So, again, if you're watching the video and I don't provide questions with the video, then send me a picture of waste. Like, I don't know, like a waste basket or trash, something like that. Also, if you're watching a video for extra credit, you could like the video and send a screenshot that showed that you liked it. And that's it. Um, I'll see you guys in lab on today or Wednesday. And if you're online, don't forget to send me those words by 9 a.m. If it's after that, you're late. And for you, since you are late, um, if you. Oh, you're on there. Perfect. OK. Oh, that sucks. All right. Well, you're good then. As long as you have all the all the uh, the words, then you're good. Awesome.